Good afternoon. Um, so, at CARE, which is the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, our mission is threefold. First, we are interested in advocating compassion as a core dimension of the human psychological landscape. Second, we're scientifically investigating the biological correlates of compassion, what bodily systems contribute to and enable and support compassion. And related to that, how do these systems contribute to health and well-being and improved psychosocial functioning? Third, we're developing programs, educational interventions, to help people develop, strengthen, enhance their own capacity for compassion and their incentive to behave in an altruistic way in accordance with their compassion. Um, a question that I often encounter in this line of work is, why compassion? Is compassion even good? Is it going to help me? Does it feel good when it's happening? Am I going to have more success in the workplace if I'm more compassionate? Or am I going to be more vulnerable and exploitable? Am I going to form more meaningful and satisfying relationships if I have more compassion? Right? Um, the broad way to ask that question is, am I going to survive and pass on my genetic material if I'm a more compassionate person? Right? From evolutionary construct. So to even begin to address that question, me and my colleagues at UC Berkeley realized that we needed to define compassion, right? As Gretchen Reeves told us, the science of emotion is, is very, very young. You can't find an agreed upon consensus definition of compassion. So we looked at the literature in the science of emotion, we looked to social psychology, we looked at neuroeconomics, right? Behavior that has to do with altruism and, and, and charity. And we, and we came up with this uh, little cartoon Sorry, I'm pointing up there to define compassion. Okay, so it's you, what is it? Um, well, first it's in response to an image of vulnerable suffering. Um, and then what happens is you're filled with a feeling that we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment and a desire to do something about that suffering. All right? So a feeling that arises in response to seeing suffering and then a desire to do something about it, all right? This is what we think is compassion. We think it's a unique and specific emotion, all right, along the list of emotions, and that it has unique and discrete physical parameters, <coughs> cognitive parameters, and motivational parameters. So now, to answer that question again, is compassion good for you? I'm gonna invite you on a slow motion journey through all the processes that emerge when we have an opportunity to feel compassion, all right? So the first thing that happens, whoops, sorry. I, no, 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 sorry, I forgot, I forgot the, um, what the, the last part of compassion, right? This is the feeling, and then at the end, of course, when you do help, you get this nice experience where the other person is uh, relieved of suffering, and then you actually feel some pleasure in response to that also. So, no, the first thing that happens in response to a, a, a target, a vulnerable suffering, is empathy, all right? So empathy is this basic process that we are equipped with, this reflexive capacity to simulate an emotional response, a feeling in our body when we see another person expressing an emotion. Okay? We mimic other people's face, facial expressions. We have a bodily response that um, arises, and infants do this within the first six weeks of life. Okay? They're already making faces that you're making. They don't know what it means. Right. If you play an infant, another infant crying, that infant will begin to cry. They don't do this if they hear their own crying. Okay? We are wired to be responsive at a physical level to the uh, expressions of the people that are near um, and expressing expressions towards us. So this is empathic mirroring. Is empathic mirroring good for you? Okay. Well, if you're good at mirroring, you understand other people's emotions much better than if you're not good at mirroring. To the tune that if you have impairment at empathic mirroring, you fall into the range of autistic spectrum disorders. And in extreme cases, sociopathy. Okay? 
Okay, so empathic mirroring is good for you, right? <laughs> so the other half of empathy that if you were to think about it or, or look into it is uh, what's called cognitive empathy. And this is a, a sort of separate, later developing system that enables you to understand and identify the meaning of people's emotional expressions. And what you're looking at are the six sort of universal emotions that Paul Ekman's pioneering work uh, demonstrated were, were readable by all humans, regardless of their contact with each other. Um, I think the list is much longer. I think compassion should be on this list. I think the only reason Paul Ekman didn't pick it up is because he was only looking at the face, when in fact, we use our voice to convey emotions. We use postural cues to convey emotion. Okay? If we put all that stuff together, we would be really good at picking up uh, expressions of compassion also. So um, emotional understanding, cognitive empathy, really this is just a developmental learning process. If you're not good at this, if you haven't figured out how to make associations between stimuli that you perceive, meaning, and linguistic um, expressions, names, it's likely that you're also having a more global learning disability. Okay, so cognitive empathy, empathic mirroring, both good for you, the very first part of compassion. Okay, so what happens next? Well, after you've had this experience of relating to this other thing, to uh, identifying the meaning of it, you have this opportunity to reflect inward for a moment, right? What does this mean to me? Is this something that I need to worry about? And um, if you're mirroring, presumably, to do this the whole time, just like up here trying to get this to work. And, um, hey, hey, hey. If, if you're mirroring, and you're, you're, say you're looking at somebody who is uh, experiencing extreme fear, right? You might show a fear face, and that might be uh, helpful in your understanding what that other person is feeling. But to have that experience in an enduring, long-term fashion isn't going to serve you, right? What happens? Then you run away. You actually don't feel compassion. You're like, ah, I'm afraid too. This is bad. I'm leaving, right? In order to, <laughs> in order to shift, right, from this mirrored experience, this physical arousal, to orienting towards the concerns and the needs and the well-being of another person, one has to reinterpret their physical experience. I'm not simply reflecting them. This isn't a threat to me. This is their pain. This is their suffering. And I am fueled with this energy, with this arousal, for the very purpose of doing something, for the very purpose of helping them, not for getting myself out of the room and away from the situation. So in our work at Berkeley, we sort of uh, try to depict this time and time again, the difference between a mirrored, uh, unpleasant state and a uh, compassion, compassionate expression that happens with that reinterpretation. Okay. The second half of coping that I want to talk about uh, relates to what Dan Sapp was talking about, this idea of feeling effective, of being present in the moment, of knowing that where you are and what you're doing is important and meaningful. All right? Having this sense that you can do it. You can make a difference. Right? It's not going to help you to, be to, to, to feel compassion if you feel like there's nothing you can do, that you're ineffective. Right? Feeling effective in the world, being able to um, affect change and control the elements of your environment is associated with all kinds of lifelong benefits. You're healthier, you're happier, you're more successful at work, you're willing to pursue things that are challenging, you're willing to reach out for difficult goals. Okay? Having these coping strategies that are part of compassion are beneficial to you in other aspects of life. Okay, so having mirrored, understood, reinterpreted, now you're left in this position of I want to do something but I don't know what, right? But <coughs> luckily, we all come into the world with an intrinsic social bonding system, right? We have mechanisms that make it really easy for us to enjoy connecting with other people, right? The mere presence of another person leads to reduction in stress, right? When somebody touches us on the arm, our immune response is strengthened. We're more comfortable. We're more capable, all right? Having this core nurturing system engaged is a benefit to us. It feels good. It strengthens us. It makes us healthier and happier. Not having a solid early life experience, and we heard about attachment formation, not engaging this system for social bonding early on actually predicts 
poor, uh, poor relationships later in life, less satisfaction, less success at building alliances and cooperating with people. All right, so you want to let your, your embracing your, your care and nurturance system emerge. The um, currency of the care and nurturance system is oxytocin, right? If you haven't heard about oxytocin, if we could bottle it and put it in Coca-Cola, <laughs> that would make Coca-Cola very happy, okay? Oxytocin makes us feel good. It reduces our stress. It makes us um, happier. So, um, the next construct that seems relevant, and this one is a little bit more cognitive, and a little bit more, the onus is on us to play a role in how we view other people, okay? This, the, the extent to which we consider other people as part of our sort of inner circle, like we typically do with our friends, defines whether or not we're gonna feel compassion. And Paul Ekman, one of the pioneers in emotion research, already suggests that compassion for close others is a natural inborn capacity. We all have it, we're, we're, we're equipped with it, we've evolved with this important um, property. But what happens when you're confronted with the suffering of another person who is not part of your inner circle? Okay? Research is showing that actually, even if you do something like snort oxytocin, right, shoot a little oxytocin in your nose, you will feel more trust towards those people who are your close others, but you won't towards those out people who are, you consider as your out group. Okay? So what do we need to do? What do we need to do to make ourselves sort of transcend this and have a kind of compassion that's going to contribute to world peace? We need to widen our circle. Right? We need to stretch that that circle of concern and so that our, or in, a, in a concentric situation that overlaps with friends and then friends of friends and then colleagues and then other people and strangers and when you really spend a lot of time being compassionate and exercising compassion and embracing your capacity and feeling the pleasure that comes with compassion, your rivals are going to start to approach into your inner circle and this is something that will give you lots of access to more people. They could be your cooperators, your colleagues, Right? your resources for information. We've heard a lot about social media today and how helpful it is in uh, gaining uh, momentum towards a particular goal or compassionate action. The last part of uh, compassion that I want to talk about has to do with how it feels. All right? It might seem like the important thing to do when you see suffering is to get out of there because you don't want to see that suffering anymore. Right? But really, if you hold out, if you stay present with that suffering, Right? And you engage, and you allow your, your nurturance care systems to work and to guide you towards some sort of compassionate action, you get this incredible warm glow, empathic joy, collective pleasure, right? And it's way bigger than the gain of having escaped to begin with, right? So basking in the warm glow, I'm showing you Mother Teresa, we don't all have to be that good. I'm showing you some ladies in uh, New Jersey who are building, oh, who are cooking Thanksgiving dinner, happy people working at Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Bill Zimbardo, a famous psychologist who is doing research with uh, former gang members who have returned to become mentors. And then finally, Siobhan, who is the founder of One Mama, and you'll all have the wonderful privilege of listening to her a little bit later this afternoon. Um, it feels good to act compassionately. You get a reward for doing that intrinsically. You're filled with that. Um, I'd like to leave with a poem. Uh, this poem is written by a sort of foremost um, pioneer, emissary, advocate of compassion, maybe one of the most accomplished compassion um, promoters uh, right now, uh, the Dalai Lama. And he wrote this poem. Uh, for the, uh, the World Peace Festival in 1994, and I like it because I think it really encompasses all of these qualities that I've conveyed in the last 14 minutes <laughs> and tried to convince you are part of compassion and that benefit you should you elect to embrace and develop more compassion in your life. Whatever happens, never lose hope. Develop your heart in your country, and I think he means the U.S. <laughs> Too much energy is devoted to cultivating the mind. Be a source of compassion, not just for your friends, but for everyone. Be a source of compassion. Work for peace, and I tell you again, never lose hope. Whatever happens, whatever happens around you, never lose hope.